Billionaires in Space. The ginormous footprint of billionaires in space and the implications of space exploration on this episode of Growthbusters. Welcome to Growthbusters, the podcast that will help you, your friends, your elected officials, colleagues, come to terms with natural limits to growth. I'm Dave Gardner. I directed the documentary Growthbusters, Hooked on Growth. That movie is celebrating its 10-year anniversary this year, believe it or not. And I am joined in this episode of the podcast by a very special co-host, Stephanie Gardner. Welcome to the podcast, Stephanie. Thanks, Dad. (laughs) That's right. Stephanie's my daughter. And uh, Stephanie, why did you agree to come on the podcast? Well, being the daughter of a growth buster, I've always had an interest in the topics that you discuss on the podcast, and I'm honored that you've invited me to join you today. So, Stephanie, I didn't have time to write up a fancy introduction, so I'm going to do the lazy thing here and invite you to introduce yourself. What do you think is important for listeners to know? I went to college and I got a bachelor's degree in environmental studies. That was quite a while ago now, over a decade ago. That was a really cool kind of comprehensive overview of a lot of different topics from economics to uh, land use, earth sciences, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to get my master's of environmental law and policy at Vermont Law School And in that program, really discovered the impact that energy has on sustainability and our society's footprint. And I became a huge energy nerd. And so I've really, since then, made my career in the energy field, working mostly for utilities around topics such as energy efficiency and smart grid topics. So is it safe to say then that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Yes, I think in this case, that's very true. <laughs> well, and I think I was I was indoctrinated into the Growth Busters community early on. I remember I was 22 living in Seattle and I hosted a public screening of the Growth Busters documentary. Yeah, and you know, you even starred in one of the videos on our YouTube channel. Yep. That was a long time ago. Should we put a link in the show notes or would you rather we didn't? We can do that. All right. Well, you've got some good educational experience in the environmental field. And I, God knows I've brainwashed you every chance I've got. So I think that'll be an interesting conversation. So thanks for lending your perspective today. My pleasure. So July was a big month for space travel and exploration. On July 11th, Richard Branson took a team in his own Virgin Galactic craft to an altitude about 50 miles over the earth. And July 20th, we had Jeff Bezos and his Blue Origin flight where he topped that uh, by a few miles. Their new Shepard craft crossed briefly above the Kármán line, an internationally recognized boundary of space, more than 62 miles above the earth before they descended and re-entered the earth's atmosphere. And as I understand it, this fall, Elon Musk's SpaceX uh, is planning its first all-civilian flight of the Inspiration4, and they're going to spend several days in orbit around Earth unless those plans have changed. So we've got three billionaires monkeying around in space. Exciting times. (laughs) I guess so. I think these flights raise some important questions that we're going to discuss in this episode. One, are these billionaires advancing science? Two, What is the carbon footprint of these launches? Owing to the climate crisis and the urgent need to get to zero net emissions by 2050, should space exploration be maybe put on hold while we tackle that emergency? And three, how do billionaires stack up when it comes to ecological footprint? You have any questions to add to the list, Steph? No, I think these were the exact same questions I had myself when I was seeing some of these headlines and news clips the past month. So number one, what are these billionaires in space up to? Are they advancing science or are they feeding their egos and expending massive amounts of money that might be better spent on solving shorter term crises here on Earth rather than on perhaps expensive hobbies? 
Or are they preparing to colonize space and get humanity into the intergalactic destruction game, kind of like the Borg from the Star Trek The Next Generation TV series? I guess my initial thoughts are some dubious ones. I think that these billionaires, if you look at the industries that they lead, it's it's hard to connect those necessarily to scientific advancements or solving big problems that we face here on Earth. Maybe with the exception of Elon Musk and his uh, battery technology and electric vehicles, though, maybe might be a slight exception. Yeah, I think as we dig in deeper into the motivations of each of these billionaires, we might discover that Elon, um, his longer term goal really has nothing to do with Earth at all. And so I think, you know, what what are the motivations that these folks have to get to space? Yeah, yeah. Let's dive deeper. Yep. Richard Branson seems to be all about space tourism. He's planning to sell seats on hundreds of flights a year. That's my quick take on it. And he happens to be an investor in a company that's planning to do some asteroid mining. So that's kind of Borg-like in my estimation. I know Musk has talked about uh, colonizing Mars. And uh, I think he sees this as testing the technology and advancing his agenda to ultimately get uh, a million people on Mars. And we'll talk more about that. And I was pretty skeptical like you, but on the subject of Jeff Bezos, as I watched the news conference the day that Jeff Bezos took his flight into space, he said something that made me think, I don't know, maybe he's not planning to plunder space or just profit from space tourism. Take a listen to this one comment that he made. You can tell when you're onto something, and this is important. Uh, we're going to build a road to space so that our kids and their kids can build the future. And we need to do that. We need to do that to solve the problems here on Earth. This is not about escaping Earth. Every time I read an article about people wanting to escape Earth, they say, no, 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 no. The whole point is this is the, mo- this is the only good planet in this solar system. We've sent robotic probes to all of them. This is the only good one, I promise you. And we have to take care of it. And when, if you go into space and see how fragile it is, you'll want to take care of it even more. Again, I think my first reaction is, is one of skepticism. If Jeff Bezos was really focused on solving Earth's problems, wouldn't he be advocating for that in more tangible ways on Earth now? I think everything that he's saying is so future oriented. You know, I think his vision is to take all heavy industry and move it up into space to keep Earth this beautiful gem of a planet that it is. And, (laughs) you know, I, I think if that was the goal, you know, why a rocket? Why not a space elevator, for example? If you're trying to move materials or wastes in and out of the atmosphere, you know, build a big space elevator that has a lower impact and can lift more materials. I've heard about the ideas around dealing with our nuclear waste issue on the planet. And the idea of launching our nuclear waste into space has come up. And our track record at successfully launching rockets is so low that there's a really huge risk that we could essentially explode our nuclear waste in our atmosphere, which would obviously be game over. So it just seems to me like there are some alternative paths to solving these issues. Well, you hit on something that I think is worth uh, a little bit of extra attention, uh, and that is if they want to solve the problems that we have here on Earth, you would think maybe they would be devoting more of their resources to that. And Lord knows, all three of these guys are in the top five richest people on the planet. So they've got the financial wherewithal to do a lot. My thinking there is they really must not understand the tenuous nature of our existence today. Yeah, I think I think that they're probably pretty out of touch. And maybe we can talk more about that later. I, I guess one other thought I have is, you know, you, you talk about are they feeding their egos? I think absolutely. I think that in our society, we've created this sort of celebrity Hollywood culture around 
space and the romanticism of space. You know, you think about the successful TV and film franchises like Star Trek, Star Wars, even Marvel franchises taking place in space. You know, I think billionaires nowadays are really celebrities. They act like celebrities. They're treated like celebrities. And so, are, are, you know, are they trying to star in their own real life space film of their own making is one of my thoughts. Well, you know what I thought about, would I go if I was given the opportunity to go into space? And I think I would, even if it was pretty risky, because, wow, I mean, that is the ultimate adventure. So I think it could just be the adventure. I wouldn't go into space in order to have my 15 seconds of fame on uh, CNN. I would go into space so that I could experience weightlessness and see the big blue marble and really be out there kind of like all of those uh, action heroes that I've seen in all of the movies and TV shows that definitely romanticize it. And you you wouldn't post it on your Facebook when you got back? Oh, yeah, I would. (laughs) (laughs) You better believe it. (laughs) But I don't know if it's for fame. I don't think I'd be counting how many friends I had or followers I had as a result of that. Yeah, I I get that. But uh, Bezos said it's not about escaping Earth. And I wonder how much of this might be that very thing. You know, we have uh, pretty much done all the damage we can do to this planet and there's no coming back. You know, we're at the brink. Maybe they understand it better than we think. They know we have driven civilization right into Thelma and Louise territory, and we're about to go off the cliff, and this is their escape plan. We've certainly seen some TV series that kind of followed that plot line. Yeah, there's a lot of post-apocalyptic space storylines, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly, Branson and Bezos, they weren't just universally applauded for these feats. There was some criticism. And of course, in today's social media environment, of course, there's going to be some criticism. So so there were some people who were clearly kind of unimpressed. And there was a, a Vox story, how bad is space tourism for the environment? Uh, and in that story, reporter Rebecca Hellwell wrote, These trips are meant to be enjoyed by space nerds who longed to be astronauts. But there's another reason rich people want to go to space, demonstrating exclusivity in conspicuous consumption. More than a few people can afford a trip to Venice or the Maldives, but how many people are privileged enough to take a trip to space? Sridhar Tyre, a Carnegie Mellon business professor, told this Fox reporter, What a nice way of showing off these days than to post a picture on Instagram from space. Yeah, so maybe it is, uh, if it's not for the fame, it might just be for the status. Yeah. Who's got the biggest island? Who's got the biggest private plane? Who's got the biggest yacht? Who got into space first? So do you want to talk about mining asteroids or... Let's talk about mining asteroids. That was really the first thing that came to my mind, and it really didn't seem to get a lot of conversation around these events, but I, you know, I was aware and astonished that people with a lot of money for several years, or really almost a decade, have been talking about mining asteroids and, you know, putting things into motion in order to make that happen. And I, the way I look at that is, how conceited can we be? We can't find a way to live within our means on this planet. We just have to continue to get bigger and bigger and consume more and more. And that is, that just reminds me of the Borg, these villains who were originally introduced to us in the TV series Star Trek The Next Generation, and then in uh, the movie Star Trek First Contact. Let me play for you what the Borg told the people from Earth when they first encountered them. We are Borg. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. The whole idea of mining asteroids seems like we have met the Borg, and the Borg is us. If that's what we're going to do, we're going to start colonizing space to use the raw materials from space, because we've already used up what we've got here. Yeah. When I first heard about this concept, I think I was envisioning massive amounts of material Right. Like if you think about mining granite, um, gravel, you've seen the size of those dump trucks. 
Yeah, there, I'm, I'm thinking massive amounts of material that would be really expensive to move around between space and the planet. But it seems like they're really interested in, in more like precious metals, maybe things that are small amounts of metal that go into all of our electronics. Ah, uh, so the carbon footprint of moving them might not be so substantial. Yeah, and they're very, very rare on Earth. A different perspective on what this type of mining might entail. Interesting. So I brought up carbon footprint, and that was certainly a, a question and a critique that uh, both of these billionaire launches in July brought up was, geez, what is the carbon footprint of this uh, minutes-long joyride into space? And so there was some interesting information about that, and we're going to include links in the show notes to some of this information. Bezos used liquid hydrogen, so technically the launch had no carbon emissions. Yeah, I thought that was really surprising because I know, you know, people chatter on the internet. Everyone was sort of comparing this statistic for other types of rocket fuel that are actually combusting oxygen in some sort of fuel, like a carbon-based fuel where the resulting byproduct is CO2. So that would create direct CO2 emissions and substantial CO2 two emissions, over 300 tons of CO2 for one rocket launch. But if you dig a little deeper, it turns out that the fuel for Bezos's flight is actually hydrogen-based. And so you have to obviously create the hydrogen, which requires electricity. And depending on the source of that electricity, it could have a carbon footprint, but probably not as much as the carbon-based rocket fuels. But it does take a lot of uh, a lot of energy to create that hydrogen. And you know what, when you think about it, uh, what's the embedded energy in all of that infrastructure, you know, all of the rockets and the capsules that have been manufactured and the moving of people across the continent, you know, for years and years as all of this technology has been developed and manufactured, there's got to be a pretty significant carbon footprint just in the, you know, before they ever even light the fuse on that rocket. Yeah, absolutely. And then the um, the Virgin Galactic, Richard Branson's spacecraft, is, is sort of an interesting model. It actually, it, the rocket itself is sort of carried up into a high atmosphere by a plane, mm -hmm. like a more traditional plane, and then the spacecraft is launched from there. So, you know, he kind of makes these claims about it being more environmentally friendly. But I know, Dad, you were able to dig up sort of a comparison between taking a ride on the Virgin Galactic rocket versus, say, a transatlantic flight from London to New York. Yeah, this was really pretty fascinating that the Virgin Galactic trip to the edge of space, the carbon dioxide emissions per passenger per mile are estimated at 12 kilograms of CO2, while a business class transatlantic trip from London to New York emits 0.2 kilograms of carbon dioxide per passenger per mile. You know, the per passenger stats are going to be really unimpressive for these space flights. But it's a little less damning if you just compare it to like, I, th I think one of these launches was something like the equivalent of four 747s crossing the Atlantic. Still, that's a lot. That's a lot of carbon emissions. And that made me think that even if they were advancing science, even if this was NASA doing these missions, Knowing what we know today about the extreme emergency we're in and how much we've got to reduce carbon emissions just in the next nine years, if we were really rational and we recognized the emergency we're in, wouldn't we say, you know what, we're going to have to put science on hold in this case, because this is a pig when it comes to carbon emissions, all the embedded energy plus, you know, the, you know just using hydrogen as a major component of the fuel alone isn't going to reduce the, the heavy footprint of that scientific development, wouldn't it make sense to just put that on hold until we have resolved the climate crisis? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think we struggle with this on a variety of topics. There's a lot of things that we should be setting aside to focus on the climate crisis. And 
it seems like the last thing we need are space tourism trips for the wealthiest people. I think that even if these very expensive trips for the wealthiest few, even if they're not ultimately raising the needle a ton on emissions, you know, if you compare it to the uh, 1800 transatlantic flights that are normally running per day, I, I think that I'm more concerned personally with what else could these billionaires' money be doing right now to solve Earth's biggest challenges. And I'm also concerned with the equality, or lack thereof rather, related to these few people using way beyond their fair share here, while, while everyone else is, is sort of left in the, in the space dust. Like, you know, personally, I, I try and offset any airplane travel. I've tried to greatly reduce any airplane travel. And then I look up at the headline and the wealthiest people are having these joy rides, essentially. And I feel guilty for traveling to visit my family at the holidays. <laughs> and I didn't drive to the gym today. I rode my bicycle to the gym in order to keep my uh, carbon footprint at a minimum. And these people have uh, gyms in their yachts and their airplanes. So let's dig into that a little bit. Certainly, they could afford to steer some billions in the direction of trying to solve the climate crisis. I'm a little bit reluctant to even suggest that because the key things that we need to do are to have that culture shift, you know, to stop chasing economic growth, to stop pursuing and celebrating population growth, to begin shrinking the human enterprise, to be content with enough uh, instead of being in this never-ending quest for more of everything. And so what do you do if you get a couple billion dollars from one of these billionaires? How do you steer it into that? You know, it, it's easy to see steering it into uh, blanketing the desert with solar panels or installing wind turbines offshore like crazy, something like that, you know, green energy. But uh, that alone isn't going to solve the problem. I think I'm in agreement. I think that there's a couple of examples that these individuals could be setting for the rest of us, right? They could be using their money in a very different way than they are. And they could be demonstrating a lifestyle choice that instead of influencing others to yearn for the yacht, for working until they have the status symbols, the house, the cars, the vacations... They could be indicating that you don't have to have all this wealth and money to be happy and to enjoy life and have purpose in life. So I think there's really two ways that they could be setting a much better example for everyone else. And they're, it's a lost opportunity. They're not doing that. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about uh, how these billionaires stack up when it comes to their uh, ecological footprint. First of all, I was shocked to discover that there's 2,775 billionaires. Holy yeah, moly. That's, that's a crazy number. <laughs> that's crazy, all right. And they're worth uh, about $13 trillion, up from about $8 trillion a year ago. 724 of them are in the United States, 698 in China, interestingly. And we'll include a link to the Forbes list. And there's really two lists at Forbes. One is uh, a given point in time when they decide to publish their issue about billionaires. But then there's a real-time list that it gets updated by the minute, I think, you know, as the value of these billionaires' holdings goes up and down. So number one on the list Jeff Bezos, worth $186 billion on May 10th, when the last Forbes issue about this was published. But on the real-time list, it was already up to $192 billion on August 1st, when I last looked at it. And he had actually dropped to number two in the real-time list. He's got a $65 million jet, an $80 million penthouse in New York, and he's having a $500 million super yacht uh, built right now. So he's obviously not worried about his personal footprint, is he? Nope, seems to have no concern whatsoever. Yeah. Now, we did find an interesting study. A couple of anthropologists did a study to estimate as closely as possible what the carbon footprint is of 20 billionaires 
but it takes a bit of work. I think they were in the United States because it was easier to access the information to come up with these estimates. And so their estimated carbon footprint for Jeff Bezos two years ago was 2,224.2 tons. Okay, so a little over 2,000 tons. The average U.S. resident has an annual carbon footprint that's way too high, 15 tons. The global average per person is 5 tons. So Bezos is 148 times the average in the U.S., 444 times the global average. That's that's just obscene. I agree. And I sometimes I have a hard time wrapping my head around these numbers. So if you think about comparing them to 148 average Americans, that's helpful. One other comparison I calculated was those carbon emissions is the equivalent to approximately 400 American homes electricity use for one year. Wow. So all of his emissions in one year could power 400 American homes. Very good point. Now, you know, uh, overpopulation is an issue that we discuss uh, often on the Growth Busters podcast. So I was curious about the kids because, you know, if a billionaire has kids, those kids are probably going to grow <laughs> grow up <laughs> with expensive taste and carry on the dynasty. And so you kind of have exponential growth of the billionaire class, which is kind of sad. On our report card here, Jeff Bezos, four kids, one adopted. Not as bad as Elon Musk, who is up to six kids. Let's talk about the rest of the report card for Elon. He was worth $151 billion in May, $179 billion August 1st. Estimated footprint was a little less, just over 2,000 tons in 2018. And they say it would be lower today. Uh, he had eight houses and one private jet, but in 2020, he sold all of his houses. Yeah, apparently Elon doesn't even take vacations. You know, I, I did read a biography on him several years ago, and my impression, having read that biography, was that he is just very much a workaholic, and it's just work, work, work. He doesn't take the time to enjoy the fruits of his labor. He's so dedicated and focused on running his companies and, and this long-term vision of Mars colonization. Yeah. So that would explain why he has no yacht. Yeah. So maybe he gets a better score on the ecological footprint scorecard until you start incorporating his space flights, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, moving down to number four on that Forbes list, Bill Gates, he certainly gets uh, talked about as one of the richest people in the world, worth $132 billion on August 1st. Now, his footprint is significantly bigger. The estimate of his annual carbon footprint is 7,493 metric tons of carbon. Apparently, that's mostly from a lot of flying. But that is 500 times the U.S. average. Yeah, that's CO2 emissions equivalent to 1,630 passenger vehicles driven for one year, or 912 million smartphones charged. Wow. <laughs> and let's see, there's always his $127 million estate in Medina, Washington, 6,131 square meters for those of you outside the United States where we just don't know what a meter really is. <laughs> so I had to do the conversion. 66,000 square feet, 23 car garage, a 20 person cinema and 24 bathrooms. 24 bathrooms. Do you think they're all in use at the same time? <laughs> I hope they're all low flush. <laughs> He also owns at least five other dwellings in Southern California, the San Juan Islands, North Salem, New York, New York City, and a horse farm, four private jets, a seaplane, and a collection of helicopters. Just a casual collection of helicopters. Now, I mentioned that uh, Bezos was uh, having this yacht built, and so I want to circle back to the yacht thing, because the yacht is kind of like the ultimate and in fact, these anthropologists indicated that that's the worst thing you can do for your carbon footprint is to own and operate a yacht. 
They estimate that a super yacht with a permanent crew, helicopter pad, submarines, and pools. Submarines. <laughs> yep. Emit 7,020 tons of carbon dioxide a year, according to their calculation. Now, the yacht that Bezos is having built is 417 feet long. It's so big that it has a support yacht. And, and part of it is that this super yacht is actually a, a sailing vessel. It's got three masts. It's intended to sail under wind power. So good for you, Jeff, <laughs> for having that sail under wind power. But because it's got sails, it can't have a helipad. So it's going to have a support boat <laughs> with a helipad <laughs> following it around. So it really undoes all the good that you're doing by you know, wind powering your sailing yacht. <laughs> now, there were rumors that he was the owner of the Flying Fox, another yacht, and I haven't been able to verify that that rumor was true, but the Flying Fox is out there, and it's apparently available for charter, and let me tell you just a little bit about it. It's 136 meters long. It has two helipads, a 40-foot pool. It does have a cinema, 36 guest cabins, four decks. It takes a crew of 54 people to run the thing. The annual estimated Operating cost is $15 million. If you've got $4 million laying around, you can charter it for one week. And that's the 18th largest super yacht in the world. So there's 17 other yachts that are bigger hogs than that. So darn, I always wanted to be super rich, to have the biggest house, the nicest car, and a yacht was on my list too. I wanted one. What happened to that dream? Gosh, it was almost in my grasp. It was just right there, just out of my reach when I got religion about overshoot and limits to growth and the fact that we just had to get over ourselves and start scaling back. Just in the nick of time, I figured all that out. Yep. Close call. Oh, come on. I thought you would argue with me. <laughs> <laughs> so close. But, you know, I did in a previous life. I was just like most of the people in the U.S., you know, pursuing that fake American dream, uh, looking for those symbols of success. Those would be an indication that you had done everything right. Everything you had done in business was the, was the right decision. And, and, and as a result, you could jet off to the Mediterranean, hop on your yacht and be served, waited on hand and foot by a 54-person crew. It seemed like, well, that's what you would do if you were making billions of dollars. You know, I think it would be really hard for any of these billionaires to step out of that and do what you're describing, which they really need to do. Set a good example. Yeah, there's a lot of cultural pressure around conspicuous consumption and I think even the competition element. You bet. This new pursuit of space has been termed the new space race. And rather than a race between nations, it's a race between the wealthiest. Amazing. And so there's obviously an element of competition yeah. between these guys going on. That's mind boggling. Now, I don't want to give some other billionaires a, a total pass. Uh, number five on the list, Mark Zuckerberg. Number eight on the list, Google's Larry Page, who is an investor in the asteroid mining company we talked about. Number six, Warren Buffett. At $101 billion on August 1st. Charles Koch, number 28, with just a measly $46 billion. you got to go way down the list to get to Sir Richard Branson. He's number 589, worth only $4.8 billion on August 1st of 2021. And yet Branson has um, certainly has some possessions and some habits that are worth, uh, I don't know, could you say we're shaming them a little bit? I think it's that's unavoidable. Safe to say we're doing a little bit of that. Yeah, but I think they've put themselves out there publicly. Yeah. And it's fair game. It's a good thing that they all listen to the Growth Busters podcast every time a new episode comes out. Yeah, maybe they'll call in. So Branson uh, famously has a private island, Necker Island in the British Virgin Islands, that he purchased for a measly $180,000 in 1978. Got a good deal on that. 74 acres. Private groups, a maximum of 40 people, can book the whole island. Apparently, it's about $87,000 a night. But that's just one of his two islands. He's got another private island, Mosquito, that he bought in 2007 that's adjacent 
to Necker Island. It's bigger, 125 acres, and that's where his private estate is with just 11 rooms. And he's been selling off lots on that island to some neighbors. You can bet that's a pretty exclusive group, all with pretty big footprints. Now, come on, admit it. If you had a friend who invited you to their private island, wouldn't you go? Not if it was named Mosquito Island. (laughs) Unless I brought my bug spray, I suppose. (laughs) Well, I like the 2020 report that compared net income to emissions globally and showed that the top 1% of earners or people at the top 1% of income are responsible for 15% of emissions. And the same study also showed that the richest 10% accounted for 52% of emissions. And I think that these statistics are really telling. And when I realized that these statistics were global numbers, and I thought about the fact that there's billions of people that live on less than a dollar a day, I was wondering, you know, what, what kind of income do you have to have to be in the top 1% or the top 10%? And surprisingly, To be in the top 1%, your net income, and these are 2015 numbers. The study came out in 2020, but it was based on contribution to emissions that accrued between 1990 and 2015. So in 2015, you had to have an income of $109,000 to be in the top 1%. Wait, you just said 109,000? 109,000. That's it? That's it. And if you were in the top 10% of net income globally, your net income only needed to be $38,000. So if our listeners are a lot of Americans or Europeans, there's a good chance that you fall into those categories. But I don't think that this is surprising, right? I think we know that American footprint, European footprint, we are responsible for the greatest emissions. So I think it's interesting to look at these billionaires and recognize how out of proportion their emissions are, but there's only 2,000 of them. And then you look at the global picture, and 10% of people are responsible for half of emissions. Well, that's nearly a billion people Mm -hmm. who are responsible for how much? 52% of global emissions. And that's uh, that's most of us. I'm glad you wanted to talk about this because there's been a lot of talk about inequality. And one question that I thought might cross people's minds is, well, you know, especially looking at the carbon footprint of these billionaires, all the more reason for us to redistribute that wealth. Let's just take the 2,700 and some odd billionaires that we have on the planet. Let's just target them and reallocate those billions to the poorest people on the planet. That would be a lot more fair. It would be good for the for the poorest people on the planet. And wouldn't that go a long way toward solving the climate crisis? Well, I think, unfortunately, my concern would be that there are so many impoverished people that don't even have food, water, and energy security on a day-to-day basis. And absolutely, those people deserve that security. I I would argue that those are basic human rights. So we want to lift those people up. Mm -hmm. But in doing so, their carbon footprint is going to increase as well. So I think that there's one piece is taking care of our brothers and sisters around the world. But I think that there's a huge need for investment in clean energy making sure that when we provide more energy to these people in need, that it's carbon neutral or carbon negative rather than fossil fuel based. We need to figure out the emissions piece at the same time as we're figuring out the equality piece. Well, I think we also have to be, uh, we have to really, in a robust manner, we have got to redefine the American dream. We've got to keep the poorest people as they improve their lives, we've got to keep them from following in our footsteps because our footsteps went in a really dangerous, destructive, and foolish direction. Yeah. Focus on quality. Yeah. 
of life and those happiness metrics, those happiness indices rather than material wealth. Yep. And if we just move those billions from the billionaire class to the uh, poorest people on the planet, we're just moving the carbon footprint around on the balance sheet. Today, it's still the same carbon footprint, whether a billionaire is spending a billion dollars or one of the poorest people on the planet is spending a billion dollars. It's going to have the same carbon footprint. And we're currently engaged in two-planet living. We're almost demanding twice what the Earth can sustainably provide for us. So we've got to cut the global economy in half. Just moving billions from the richest to the poorest doesn't do anything to cut the economy in half and cut our footprint in half. Yep, we need some pretty, pretty fundamental change if we have any hope of solving the climate crisis, I'm afraid. So I've been a podcast listener over the years. I haven't listened to every episode, but I definitely tune in. And one of the segments that I really enjoy listening to are the small personal changes, creative ideas for minimizing your footprint. And I was going to see if you wanted to introduce that segment while I'm your guest host today. I think that's a great idea. You probably uh, thought about it and you're ready, aren't you? I'm ready. (laughs) That's good. I haven't thought about it, so I'm not. So you're putting me on the spot. So inspire me. You know, we just share something entertaining or quirky or really useful that we do to shrink our footprint. And you get extra stars if you come up with something that people are less likely to have thought of or if they're really going to think you're a, a nutcase because you do that. Yeah. Do listeners ever chime in with their ideas as well? I'm sure we have, but I can't think of. There haven't been many. Well, I might put it out there after I share mine. I might put it out there for listeners if they have any additional ideas that could help me out. I'd love to hear it. That's a great idea. And then maybe we could publish a bathroom book or a coffee table book with all the ideas. Sure. So what's yours? I think, Dad, you might know that I'm planning to get married. (laughs) Hopefully you got the memo on that. I heard that rumor. Yeah. So I'm in the process of starting to think about planning my wedding for next fall. And weddings have really become these huge productions. I think that In the past, they used to be much simpler, and oftentimes they were held at, you know, a personal residence, maybe in the backyard. Just cake and punch was served, but now they're multi-day, really, productions with lots of decorations, favors, guests traveling from near and far. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I live in Boston on the East Coast, but a lot of my family and friends are in Colorado, where I grew up. And I'm going to be asking people to travel for my wedding. And so one of my ideas is to, instead of a gift registry, ask those folks that are traveling to offset their carbon footprint from their travel. That's one of my ideas. Impressive. And another idea I have, and this I think is becoming more and more common just because the cost of weddings has also become astronomical, is reusing wedding decor. So I've been looking on some of the marketplace type websites out there and a lot of people resell their wedding decorations. So getting secondhand decorations or even crafting your own from materials that otherwise would be landfilled or recycled are some creative ideas I've seen. So I'm trying to incorporate that into my wedding planning. And if any listeners have any additional creative ideas, I would love the help. Well, I sure am glad I'm not going to have to charter the Flying Fox yacht for your wedding. (laughs) I was concerned about that. You know, we could rent Richard Branson's island for $87,000 for one night and have the wedding there. That would be an unforgettable wedding, wouldn't it? It's definitely way over my wedding budget. (laughs) (laughs) Well, are you aware that there have been two episodes of the Growth Busters podcast on that very subject, low footprint weddings? No, I'm going to have to go listen to those right now. We'll put links in the show notes, two, believe it or not. Wow. Because of the good folks at the Center for Biological Diversity. Okay, so you're putting me on the spot, but I've got one for you. We use electricity here in our home, and we 
actually pay our utility to make 100% of our electricity wind and solar powered. We do that in order to avoid burning coal to generate our electricity because I know the utility I'm connected to has still got uh, one coal-fired power plant burning down the street, actually two right now, but they're about to close down one of them ahead of schedule, which is great. And the truth is, even if your electricity comes from solar or wind, there's still a, a value to using less of it. If you're using battery storage, every cycle of a battery speeds that battery to its death, where you have to replace the battery. You know, so making fewer demands on that has real value. And also having fewer daily, weekly, monthly, annual demands for electricity makes it so that your utility doesn't have to put in place as much electrical generation infrastructure, which shrinks the footprint too. And, you know, we really have to reduce our energy consumption. There is no way we can convert our current world, those of us in the overdeveloped world, to carbon-free using renewable resources, consuming the amount of energy that we consume today. So we have got to reduce our energy. So I am all about using less electricity. So I do the craziest things to avoid using electricity. One is, in our house, no electric can opener. Now, what's the carbon footprint of opening a can with an electric can opener? It's got to be tiny, right? Even if you multiplied that by the richest 700 million people on the planet, it would still be fairly insignificant. But you know what? My hands and arms work just fine. I can operate a manual can opener just fine. So why should I be lazy and use electricity just to open a can? I like that one. Now... I shouldn't be opening very many cans. I should be eating locally, and locally sourced food doesn't come in a can. But every now and then, you got to open a can of pineapple and a can of Coco Lopez when you're going to make pina coladas. You sure have famous pina coladas, Dad. I'm just saying. So that's mine. Thanks for sharing that. Any last thoughts? What do you think about participating in this episode today? I want to thank you for doing that. I've really enjoyed it. It's fun to be in the hot seat after listening to the podcast over the years and help contribute to the conversation. Thanks, Stephanie, for joining me. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Visit growthbusters.org to learn more, to sign up for email updates, and to make a contribution to keep this nonprofit project alive. We promise not to buy any rocket fuel or space flights or yacht trips. Or private islands. Or private islands. Share this podcast with the billionaires in your neighborhood or even the millionaires. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters.